What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. We're doing Socket from Hack the Box, which starts out with a web server designed around reading QR codes. It also has a application for both Windows and Linux, and some light forensics on the application reveals it was built with PyInstaller, so it's just Python under the hood. You can either do some dynamic analysis, but if you do that, you have to probably run it on Ubuntu 22 because it uses glibc 235, which a lot of distros don't have as the default. Additionally, you could um, decompile the app and just do everything from source code analysis. I think it's easier to do it through dynamic analysis, so that's the way I show first. We show decompiling at the end, but the app shows some WebSocket communication that's vulnerable to SQL injection. You can dump data, uh, data out of an SQL light thing, log into the box, and then the privesk is abusing PyInstaller. You have the ability to use PyInstaller as root, and you can include files out of the root directory in what it builds and decompile and extract them. So with that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start with an nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, print the nmap directory and call it socket, and then the IP address of 10.10.11.206. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, there's just two ports open, the first one being ssh on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. We also have HTTP on port 80, and its banner tells us it's running Apache, and also redirecting us to qreader.htb. So let's go add this into a host file. So I'm gonna do sudo vi etsy host, uh, put in my password, and then 10.10.11.206, paste this in, and then we can go over to Firefox and navigate to the website. So I'm gonna go 10.10.11.206, and it redirects me to qreader.htb. And we can see it asking, what is a QR code? We can upload one. Uh, it looks like we may be able to make our own QR code. There is an application for both Windows and Linux. And we have some type of counter here, total conversions, total downloads. If I download this, let's see, I'm going to save it, refresh, and I wanna see if this increments. We don't see, oh, we do have it incrementing. So the total downloads is also, um, incrementing whenever we click something. So that's potentially something we could look at. I'm guessing the web server may just like um, do a word count in the access logs. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but just something to keep in the back of my mind. So I'm gonna embed text as ipsec and it's going to create a QR code. If I upload the exact QR code I created and we do scan image, it has the extracted text. So it looks like this is a QR code reader. The first thing I'm gonna do uh, before I poke at the app I downloaded is going to um, try like server-side template injection, things like that on this QR code. So I always go to a page on cobot.io for SSTI because they have a really good um, payload that just tests all like the frameworks, right? I don't know exactly what this web page is yet. Um, like, is it PHP? Is it Python? What is it? We can try index.php, we get not found. If we try slash index, we just hit slash, we get something. So I still don't know what it is, but I'm gonna put this payload in, and this just has a bunch of um, bad characters that if it is doing some type of SSTI and is vulnerable, chances are it will crash, right? So let's, embed this text, let's save it as QR code, replace, and we can upload this. And we see the extracted text prints everything, so I'm guessing this is not going to be um, injectable at all. So let's go take a look at, um, is this number? This number is actually incrementing as well, the total conversions, 2293. So once we pop the box, we probably should look at exactly how that works. But now that the download is finished, let's move the um, Q Reader application into our directory and we can unzip it. And if we go into the app, we have a, a test.png and Q Reader. So I'm gonna try executing Q Reader and we need glibc235. Um, 
So if I do an LDD dash dash version, I can see I am currently using glibc231. So that's why I can't execute this. So we need to get on a computer that has glibc235 in order to execute this, or we could go and uh, try to reverse this application. Um, and if we look, it is a Py installer executable, so we could decompile it, which I'm gonna do at the end of the video because um, I find decompiling this application much more difficult. Instead, let's just run it, right? If I go to my nmap, so, whoops, I have caps lock on, cat nmap, cd dot dot. We have it running Apache 2452. So I'm gonna go Google Launchpad Apache 2452. And we're gonna see what version of Ubuntu this is. And this looks like it is an Ubuntu Jammy. So this is gonna be Ubuntu 22 that this application runs in. And I already have a Jammy machine running. So I'm gonna disconnect from the VPN and switch to Jammy. So let's log in, and I'm going to have to connect to the VPN. So sudo open VPN, and I need to put my password in. And we can run the Q Reader application. So if I execute it, let's see, we do have the app actually opening. So if we do file import save quit. There's an about version, and if I click that, we get a connection error at the bottom of the window. So let's open up Wireshark. So I'm gonna do sudo Wireshark. And let's examine exactly what's going on. I'm just gonna switch to any, type DNS, and I'm going to go back to about version, go in here, and we can see it is making a query for ws.qreader.htb. So let's add that into our host file. So sudo vi etsy host, put a password, a password, and then 10, 10, 11, 206. Um, was it ws.qreader.htb? So it's talking to probably a WebSocket host. So that has been saved. Now, if I click about version, we see we have version 002. Um, we can also now change a capture. So if I stop this, I can go to ton zero, and we can see exactly what this application is doing. So I'm gonna go click about version again, and we see we make a get on slash version, it switches protocols, and then we do this WebSocket thing, and it looks like it may be encrypted because I can't see anything in this stream. I'm not actually seeing the data. Um, if we look at here, let's follow this. So I'm not seeing the actual WebSocket um, payload. So that's just closing. Does it get version? Let's follow this. I don't think anything's gonna be showing here. So instead of going in Wireshark, let's intercept this traffic, right? And the easiest way to proxy this, um, actually, I missed one thing we needed to see, exactly what port it's talking over. Do I still have Wireshark open? I don't. Let's open it. Go to ton zero the about version, or you can also do updates as well and sees uh, says you have the latest version. But if we look at this WebSocket traffic, go to layer three, we have the destination port at 5789. Nmap didn't show us this because it's not one of the top 1000 ports, but we can, do I have NC on the box? I do, we can do NC ZV 10101106. And then port, what was it, 5789. We can see that port is open. If we try to port that isn't open, like leet, we have a connection refused. 
So let's edit our host file. So I'm gonna do sudo vi etsy host, and I'm gonna say qreader is now gonna be at 127.001. So anytime the box makes a request to ws.qreader.htb, it's going to go to myself. And in burp suite, I can go over to the proxy, go to proxy settings. We can add a new listener. I'm gonna to bind to 5789. And then I'm gonna redirect everything to 10.10.11.206 and on port 5789. So what this is going to do is when I click the um, about version, it's gonna say where is um, ws.qreader.htb. It's gonna say 127.001. It's gonna open up in Burp Suite. Burp Suite's gonna look at it and then forward it to the host. So I can do about version and we don't see anything here. If I go in Burp Suite, let's go open this. Go to WebSocket history, we can see I sent the payload version 002, and this is what the application sent back to me. We can do that again if we really wanted to, version to server client, right? And I can open this up in the repeater tab, click reconnect, send, and we can look at it this way. It looks like the server hangs up after sending it, so I can't do multiple, I have to open and close every time, which is a bit annoying. Um, we can test for various like SQL injection stuff. So if I do a single quote, we get invalid version. Let's try a double quote here. And again, um, reconnect. Click send. And when I send it with a double quote, we're not getting any error message, right? If I just send it, the server just hangs up on us. So that indicates probably the WebSocket has crashed, right? It doesn't do that with a single quote. We just get the invalid version. It only does it when we send this double quote. And it has to be a double quote on the very first WebSocket message. So I'm gonna do a double quote and then a comment. So if I do this, we get the data back. So this is confirming we have a SQL injection. And I'm going to do this in a application called um, Web SoCat now, just so I don't have to keep clicking this reconnect because that would just drive me insane. So I'm gonna kill my VPN. We're gonna go back to our parrot box. And there's two tools. There's WebSoCat and there's WSCat. I think I used WSCat in a previous video, but it doesn't support accepting data from a file, um, at least not that I could find. So that's why I'm using WebSoCat here. Um, and you'll understand exactly what I mean in a second. I just need to find the right one. Um, let's see, WebSoCat unknown Linux. I don't know what the unknown is. That's mini, let's download unknown Linux MUSL. Um, it's weird, but go to downloads, chmod plus X, web socat, does it execute? I have a capital X. So I can execute this, awesome. So I'm going to move this into our file, or working directory. And I'm going to use the watch command to execute this. And we're going to send it um, something from input. So if I do dot slash web socat dash H, uh, let's see, we need WS and then Q, uh, what was it? Um, we probably don't even need the host name. We just need 5789 like this. It was probably ws.qreader.htb. But let's just try this. And I'm going to direct the input file at it. And right now we get nothing. Um, it was slash version as well. So let us go to input. And I'm going to say version, and was it 001 or 002? It was one of those. But as long as we have valid JSON, we should get data back. 
So now I can do a watch dash n one on this. And now it's going to execute this every minute. So if I change the payload here, let's do a single quote. We have invalid version, right? So we have to do the back tick. And we have that. If I put a comment, it goes back to working. So now let's do a um, union. And we can do union select one. See if there's one line. Let's do two, three, four. We could probably guess four because it's probably returning the entire um, column back to us. And that's one, two, three, four. Um, let's add a JQ dot. So it looks a bit better. So we can definitely see there's four parameters. And now we want to identify um, what version, like what SQL this is. So I'm going to do a version. And we'll see if we get any data. We don't. Let's try SQLite underscore version. And version, if this was MySQL, this would return something, right? So now I'm just enumerating what the backend database is. And because we do an SQLite version and we get data back, we know this is an SQLite database. So the next step is to um, dump the structure of this database. And we can do it with a um, select name from SQLite master where root page is equal to one. And root page in the SQLite master um, thing is similar to like an ID. And let's see, we put this in the second parameter. We got nothing there. If I do root page is equal to two, do we get anything? We get versions. We can do three. We get SQLite sequence. Four is, I think, where the actual databases start coming. And we have users there. We could also do a group concat. So instead of incrementing root page to go one, two, three, four, because we can only return one line at a time, right? But SQLite does support a group concat. So if I wanted to return everything, I could just do group underscore concat name. And then we have everything here. So instead of going one by one, we could do everything, right? And we can add, I think it's a um, thing like that. I think this appends, and SQL is going to be the actual table structures. Let's see. Um, that was invalid. Let's just do group concat SQL to make sure this works. It looks like it does. Create table, and it's telling us the table names here, so you don't even have to worry about that. Let's just take the watch command off, and we can copy this. V um, table structure. And let's see. We want to probably separate on. Let's see. If I do percent %s, we're going to do a parentheses. And probably have to escape that. And I'm going to replace that with a parentheses. And then backslash r for a line break. Let's just save it, cat table structure said, do it like this. Let's see. So we replace that, we add it, create table reports, answers. I wanna know where SQLite sequence went. backslash r backslash n, there we go. Um, I don't know why I did a cat pipe it into said. There we go. So now we have all the tables. So we have user info, reports, and answer. 
and users has username and password. So let us um, dump that. So I'm going to go back to my watch command like this. And we can edit the input to be, let's see, select, where's username? Users has username and password and role. So we can do username. And I'm actually gonna modify it. I'm gonna put everything in these parameters. So password role, like this. and from users. So we have admin, the password, and the role is admin. And we can use a limit statement. So if we do zero one, this is gonna get um, the very first entry. We can do one one, and this will get the second entry. Wait, zero one. Okay, I think zero one doesn't return anything. One one, I think returns the first. 2, 1 will return the second one, I believe, and we don't have anything there. This is the line number, and this is number of lines. Um, but again, we could do a concat. Let's see if I can get the syntax right this time. So 3, 4. We did group concat username. And this confirms um, there's just one user, but I do want to be able to append stuff. I could have swore append was, yeah. Oh, when I did it earlier, I used double quotes probably, and that broke my um, JSON. So I was right before how you do concats, right? But that just broke my JSON. So we have this password. So let us grab this and we can just search this string. This looks like it's 32 characters eyeballing it. Um, echo dash N, WC dash C, 32 characters. So I'm just going to Google it. Uh, we get spoilers. Um, I bet if we went to crack station, does this still exist? And search for this MD5 sum, say I'm not a robot. Images with a bike, crack hash. We get the password of Den Jan Jade one two two five five six six. So I'm gonna do. Let's just call it creds. Admin this. We haven't found a place to actually log into the box, and I'm kind of kicking myself because I didn't do a go buster at the start of this, right? And this is when I normally just um, go to my GoBuster file and see if there's any login forms. But because I didn't do it, um, we're now stuck waiting. So let's do op sec list discovery web content raft small words dot text, and we'll do out GoBuster dot root. There we go. It is running. There is a slash report. Um, we can also do crack map exec. So CME, SSH, um, I think it's the IP, 10.10.11.206-U, admin, dash P, this. And it's attempting to SSH. Let's see if we get in. We don't. So while GoBuster runs, um, I should have done that in a different pane, right? Oh, I did, sweet. Let's dump the other information or other stuff out of this table, right? So we have reports. So let's dump all the reports. We got reporter name, subject, and description. So let's do, let's just cat table structure so we have it. Um, reporter name, report or underscore name, then subject, And what was the other one? Description. Save it. And we have an error somewhere. Oh, because we're doing 
from users. So we want to change this to from reports. And we still have an issue. I'm just backing that up. And let's simplify our query to just have reporter name. We got two reports or two people. So if I do now subject, okay. And let's go add the description. Okay, so it's working. I probably had a typo somewhere. So I'm gonna get rid of the watch again, run it, we can copy it, and we can V, um, what is this table? Reports, paste it, and let's see, we can said, this is reports, and we just want to replace commas with line breaks. So we can see JSON except JPEG files is a way to convert JPEG, or do they need to be PNG, non-ASCII? So we have two customers, Jason and Mike, if we look at the other one, there is an answers table. So let's run this again, and let's replace this with some answers. So we can say answered by, answer, and that's all we need. We don't need to extract the date. And this will be from answers. And it looks like we have something. So I'm just going to run it manually so it's a bit easier. Let's see, we can do jq dot set version dash r for raw. There we go. So we have the admin sending the message and misspelled Jason to be JSON. And it looks like he signed it Thomas Keller. And he signed it Thomas Keller on both. So this is going to be the admin's name. If we look at creds, we do have the admin's password here. So we have to go from Thomas Keller to a potential username. And my favorite tool to do that is username anarchy, which is just on GitHub. So if I just run username anarchy with Thomas Keller, we have a bunch of potential usernames. So I'm going to copy this. I'm gonna do V usernames, paste this in, and let's rerun our crack map exec command. So CME, SSH, 10, 10, 11, 206, dash U, usernames, dash P, and we're going to wanna to use that password. So cat creds, den den jade, one, two, two, five, five, six, six. And I'm gonna let crack map exec run, and we'll see if any of these usernames um, log in. And I did a typo on usernames there, but looks fine. So it's attempting the username, Thomas, Thomas Keller, all of these, and we're getting failed. We'll just see if any of these succeed. And there we go. We have a successful hit on T Keller and this password. So let's do SSH, T Keller at 10, 10, 11, 206. Yes, put the password in and we get logged in. And the first place I go to Privesk is thinking back about the web server, right? Uh, because this number actually incremented the total downloads and total conversions. So I wanna see exactly how that logic worked. 
So I'm gonna go ver dub 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 because I'm gonna guess that's where the web information is. And we have this WebSocket server and that is in Python. We also have main and this is gonna be where the web app is. If we look at templates, we can look at index.html and we see total conversions and total downloads is these variables. So I'm going to go into main.py and let's see, search for index. I don't mean to change a file. Let's see, index. And we see download and conversions is using this get info function and get info. Um, I think there was a utils.py. And if we look at get info, it's just getting it from the database. So whenever we click that link, it just increments the number in the database. It's not doing anything sensitive. I was thinking there was a possibility it was like grepping the access log. I don't know why I thought that. Um, this is a much more elegant way to do it. So I also want to look at exactly what user this web service is running as. So I'll do a ps-ef-forest. And let's see, we have main and server.py running as the SVC user. So, um, even if we exploit it, we just get to SVC and maybe there's a pseudo rule or some other permission that SVC can do. Um, we can also do like a find dash dash name SVC to dev null to see if there's any unique files that SVC has or a um, group. And it looks like just the web service really, but I mentioned something a second ago that we didn't check, pseudo rules. Uh, if I look at sudo for my user, so let's just copy my password, sudo L. I don't even need to enter that. Um, we can execute this build installer.sh script. And we can execute it as root. Um, um, tkeller may run the following all all. So let's look at installer.sh and see what this is. The first thing it's doing is checking the number of extensions with this dollar pound sign and making sure the number is equal to two. And if the number is not equal to two and the first one is not clean up, then it's going to say there's not enough arguments specified. Um, then we have the first argument, which is gonna be action, the second argument, which is name. And then we're building a, another argument called ext and if we look at it, it's taking the name, passing it to awk, separating upon a period, and getting the last delimiter here. So this ext is obviously going to be the extension. So the next step is making sure that the name is not a symlink and the name's gonna be a file name. Then we have two actions. We have build we ha and make. Actually, we have three actions. So the build action, then the make action and the cleanup action. The build action requires, looks like a spec file and it's going to use pyinstaller probably to make an executable. The next action requires a py extension, py, and it looks like it's going to make a spec file in slash temp. Then we have cleanup, which is going to um, clean everything up. So let's do a make to make a spec file and see exactly what that looks like. So I'm gonna go in dev shm. We'll do sudo dash l real quick. Sudo build installer, um, was it make? And then ipsec.py. And we probably have to touch that file. So we'll touch ipsec.py and we can create it. And then once it's created, let's look at the spec file. So the spec file was created to tempqreader.spec. And that is obviously gonna be owned by root, but we can copy that to our directory. And when we copy it, we take the ownership of it. So now we could edit it if we wanted to. So looking at this, it's going to take ipsec.py and make an executable. And if we look at the spec file or what it is, so py installer spec file, let's see. 
I'm going to go to the latest documentation, 513. There are some parameters. The one that is interesting is the datas, because we can include non-binary files in the application. So if we can have it include non-binary files, we can just specify um, any file on the server we want because it's being ran as root and it'll be included in the final executable. And how we do it is we put it in parentheses, we specify the file and then the directory we want it in. So let's go to datas and I'm going to include um, root.ssh, everything here and we'll put it in a directory called xfill. And I'm also going to do root, root.txt, also in xfill. And we could also do things outside of this. So if we wanted to like Etsy shadow in xfill. So with this, we can now have it make or thing or build, I guess is the argument. So if we do a build on dev shm qreader.spec, um, ipsec.py not found, I guess a cron cleaned it up. I don't know why it's dev dev shm. Do I have a typer somewhere? Let's just fix that. So it looks like it is making it. And it built successfully. Where did it build to? Dev SHM dist Q reader. Uh, maybe? There is no dist folder. Let's see, ls temp. If we make this again, let's see what happens. And we may just have to look at the source code again, see exactly where it gets built. I'm gonna make a directory dist. And run this again. Let's see. Now that we have the dist directory, it is deleted. What the heck? Um, let's see. Spec. So it's moving dist build to op shared. Okay. So now we have the QReader application here. So it just moved it to this directory. Um, let's copy it. So I'm going to do nclvnp9001 and we're directed to a file called qreader.xfil and we can cat qreader, pipe it to nc10104089001. We have a connection from unknown and let's do a file on it, and let's just MD5 some both ends to make sure we have the full file. So 4B ends in 9E, 4B ends in 9E. So now we have this qreader.xfil. Um, if we do a strings against it, we can see it is pyinstaller. So now we have to decompile um, this app. So I'm gonna make a directory xfill, let's just move it in here. And I'm going to Google pyinstaller decompile. It's like pyinstractor is the application we want. Git clone, Python 3, pyinstractor like this on our executable and it creates the extracted directory. And if we go into that directory, there is a directory called xfill because that's what we specified in the datas. And if we look at it, 
we have all the files. So we have root.txt, we have authorized keys, we have IDRSA, we can chmod 600 IDRSA, and we can SSH root at 10, 10, 11, 206. And this should let us in as root. So because we could bundle things with PyInstaller, we could grab any file we wanted, right? And this kind of sets us up naturally for decompiling this entire application. Um, Cause I said I wanted to do that. So I'm just gonna make a directory decompile. We can move um, app queue reader into it. And I'm going to move xfill pyinstractor to it as well. And let's just redo what we did. So pyinstractor on queue reader. And we have successfully extracted it. And there is a note, if we ever encounter errors, we probably want to run like Docker and install Python 3.10. Um, whenever you do decompiling in Python, generally you should match the version. Um, you can see I'm using 3.9 as well. In this instance, it's not going to create an error, but you probably should use Docker to spin up a Python version of the same exact thing you are attacking, right? And now we have a bunch of PyC files. And this qreader.pyc, um, this is done in Python 3.10. Do we have that anywhere? Um, if we looked at the magic bytes, I'm sure it would say Python 3.10. If we tried to do like um, the common decompiler, which is unpyc, that does not support Python 3.10. So unpyc, a GUI tool, um, can do wow bytecodes up to three eight. Uh, the tool I'm going to use to decompile this is actually called decompile plus plus, and I actually think it was referenced on the Pi Installer page. Yeah, right here. So it references this one. There is no um, release we can download, so we'll have to just compile it ourselves. So if we do a git clone, we can go in the directory and then we use cmake to build it. And I'm gonna make a directory called build and we can do cmake dot dot, uh, command not found. Um, I guess I need to install cmake. I think that's just a simple apt install cmake. Let's try it. Yes, we probably need to do like a build dash something as well. Um, to get an environment to be able to build things, but we'll try with just CMake to see if this works. It's almost done. Processing triggers. It's probably done. Um, something erred. Docker.service. Weird. Let's try CMake dot dot. Looks like it has built. Um, so we have a make file. So if I do make, we should be able to build this now. It's going to compile and it has completed and we have pi cdc. So if I run pi cdc on HDB socket decompile Q reader extracted, and then the pyc file we want, which was I think qreader.pyc, we get source code. So let's do HDB socket qreader.py. And we can look at this file and see we have some source code to this. And we wanted to look at the web socket. So we can see on version, it's doing async IO, WebSocket connect the WS host slash version and sending what version it is. So we can see this is the payload it sends, which is what we saw in Wireshark. The json.dumps version is equal to version. So that is how you would decompile this app. Um, I found the dynamic analysis much easier to find the vulnerability. So that's why um, we went that route, but Hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care and I will see you all next time.